So, the next speaker is Professor Irit Ben Aaron. She's the director of the oncology division at Rambam Healthcare Campus. And uh, her main intre research interests are the toxic effects of anti-cancer treatments on fertility and blood vessels. But today she will focus on a very timely mission on COVID-19 and cancer patients. So thank you for coming. So, uh, good morning and thank you for uh, the kind invitation. It's my great honor to, to speak after uh, such uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So, today I'm going to talk about uh, really a timely uh, issue uh, which uh, swamped us uh, in the past two years uh, to study something that is very different from what we are doing uh, uh, usually. And this is still an unsolved dilemma. Uh, so, despite uh, the lack of concrete evidence um, at the beginning of the pandemic, cancer patients uh, were considered as usually a high-risk population for uh, COVID-19 infection, as they usually are uh, at high risk uh, for uh, infectious diseases. And uh, many of the professional associations uh, worldwide uh, recommended to uh, revisit some of the recommendations and uh, uh, in some uh, indications uh, um, it was advised to postpone chemotherapy or elective surgery or radiation for uh, specific indications in the endemic area. And, and that was a, a real problem for us as, as clinicians. Um, several recent studies uh, in the past uh, two years have appraised the clinical course um, and, and mortality and morbidity um, in um, symptomatic, and I mentioned that symptomatic because we don't uh, know the uh, incidence of asymptomatic cases uh, of uh, patients uh, who had cancer and, and COVID. And uh, pre-existing comorbidities in most of those studies, uh, such as hypertension and older age, uh, were the key factors to determine the clinical course of the disease. And this is very important because uh, in most of those studies, these are the risk factors uh, of the general population as well. And also, uh, they determine the severity of the disease in cancer patients much more than the cancer itself. And I'm talking about cancer of, of uh, solid malignancies and not hematological malignancies, or the type of treatment. Uh, the data that was presented worldwide regarding the uh, severe morbidity or mortality was very, has been and still is very conflicting. And there are many studies indicated that there is no added uh, risk. And some uh, indicate uh, there is a, a little of added risk, but still the risk factors are very much prominent. So uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was in March uh, 2020, uh, in our center we uh, really swamped into uh, trying to study this uh, population because uh, we saw that uh, there are recommendations, but there is lack of evidence. Usually we are very much uh, strict to uh, uh, performing evidence-based medicine, and here the medicine was very non-evidence. So uh, we uh, initiated uh, a prompt study and uh, prospectively followed cancer patients that were on active treatment only with solid malignancies. Uh, active intravenous uh, treatment, uh, it was uh, during the first wave, so they came only to, um, uh, to get the treatment along with the best controls, which were uh, the healthcare workers at the cancer center. Uh, I remind you that at that time, uh, nobody really uh, left home and, and the cancer patients and the workers were the only one to visit uh, the hospital. And we are uh, in a separate building, so we, they were not mixed with other patients. Uh, in this study, uh, which we uh, performed for three months, uh, we didn't uh, document any symptomatic case, uh, neither in the control uh, nor in the uh, cancer patients. And serology analysis revealed, since we uh, drew uh, blood in three time points, I will show that in a minute, uh, we uh, saw that uh, uh, the incidence of asymptomatic cases were quite the same. It was uh, 2.4 for the uh, seropositive, uh, the cancer patients, and almost 2% of uh, the healthcare workers all were asymptomatic completely. And this is the study scheme. Uh, since the beginning of March until the middle of June, we uh, took uh, three time points uh, as um, a representative uh, uh, point to, uh, to draw blood. And uh, um, what we actually uh, do in collaboration with uh, uh, Yuval Shaked, our colleague from uh, 
the, the Technion, is actually uh, perform immune cell profiling and try to differentiate between the immune cells of, of uh, uh, these patients and the healthcare workers. So uh, these are uh, the two uh, representative uh, subset uh, of cells that we uh, really notice the difference. Uh, you can see here that there are uh, the healthcare workers that were seronegative, the ones that were seropositive, uh, cancer patients that were seronegative, most of them, and the ones that were seropositive. And we can see that the, the um, CD8 uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, was much different between the healthcare workers, the general uh, population, and cancer patients. Uh, in cancer patients uh, that were infected with COVID, uh, there was no change compared to cancer patients or uh, to healthcare workers, and there was a drop in the CD8 uh, in uh, uh, the general population that were infected, and that was also the same for myeloid cells. We can see uh, an abrupt uh, decline in uh, myeloid cells uh, in the uh, general population that were uh, positive compared with uh, a drop that was not as drastic in the cancer patients that were uh, uh, so that were positive for COVID. So why do we see this differential immune response? Uh, previous studies indicate that uh, cancer patients, again, only with solid malignancies, undergoing immunological alterations toward an uh, anti-inflammation state uh, due to the treatments. Uh, and limited by the very small number that we had of positive cases, our results imply a differential immune profile for cancer patients compared with the healthy population. And I have to say that our hypothesis back then was that cancer patients may be infected with COVID, but yet may not generate uh, the cytokine storm that is uh, required to uh, have severe uh, morbidity. And uh, we uh, thought to really uh, dig into this uh, hypothesis, but the problem was that um, there was a game changer uh, very early uh, in this course uh, with the advent of, uh, of the mRNA vaccines, and therefore uh, the majority, almost um, 90 something percent of uh, the population that we had uh, were vaccinated so we could not proceed with uh, um, uh, trying to uh, get into a, a deeper um, proof, of, uh, proof of our hypothesis. So at the beginning of uh, 2021, uh, Mass vaccination was conducted in Israel, as we all know. Uh, several studies evaluated the immunogenicity and safety of the vaccine in a patient with solid malignancies. Uh, these uh, patients were not uh, uh, represented in the large trials of the vaccine, so we had no clue what is going to be the outcome uh, for those patients uh, with uh, administering uh, the uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, immunogenicity um, depicts uh, by several studies uh, from uh, the, the past year, uh, a differential pattern between immunocompromised patients. Uh, though in solid tumors, uh, most of the studies depict the same picture, uh, which is uh, comparable results compared to the general population, which is not uh, the picture uh, for hematological malignancies. What we did uh, back then in January, uh, we uh, followed a cohort of uh, more than 200 patients with solid tumors, again on active IV treatment that was easier for us to um, uh, just uh, um, uh, take them and enroll them into the uh, study once they uh, came to, to get the treatment and compare them to a 261 age match because age is a very key factor. Uh, healthcare workers, we um, followed uh, their um, uh, serology profile at 10 days after the first dose and then two weeks after the second dose and for the ones that were seronegative, we also had another time point at two weeks uh, following uh, the second uh, time point and we saw that uh, uh, after the first uh, dose and that was a very relevant uh, result since in many countries in Europe uh, because they, of the cost uh, they uh, um, were vaccinating, um, vaccinated the patients only once. Uh, so we saw that uh, one dose of the vaccine is not enough and only 29% uh, of the patients were seropositive after uh, one dose of the vaccine compared with 84% of the uh, general population. And uh, that number uh, was increased to 86%. That was very comparable to the general population after the second dose. 
And uh, the key factor that determined whether a patient is going to be seronegative was chemotherapy. So uh, patients that were treated with chemotherapy that reduced immunogenicity with an odds ratio of uh, 0.41. And uh, we saw that that was uh, the main uh, factor that determined seronegativity. When we looked at the adverse effect, and that was something that is very relevant since in the um, large uh, scale uh, prospective studies, uh, there was no documentation of uh, the effect of the vaccine on uh, blood tests and other factors since uh, that was healthy population. Uh, we had routine uh, measurement of uh, liver enzymes and, and uh, imaging of, uh, that, of those patients. We saw that in 10% of the cancer patients, there was an, uh, an elevated uh, um, level of liver enzyme that sometimes were very marked and were very disturbing uh, from our point of view. And also uh, on imaging, we could see in 5% of the patients lymphadenopathy. lymphadenopathy. That was also uh, presented in other studies, uh, either cervical or uh, in the axilla. Uh, it was very uh, notable in, in those studies uh, in the PET scan and CT scan. And we didn't see any COVID cases uh, uh, throughout the study period in both cohorts. So we continue to uh, follow those patients, uh, also uh, to look for the durable, uh, durability of um, uh, the humoral response of those patients. And uh, we had only part of them, the ones that continued the treatment throughout the six months. And the participants uh, included the 154 patients and 135 controls. Uh, we saw that um, the rate of seropositivity was the same uh, be between the patients and the controls, but the titer dramatically decreased, yet uh, was considered positive in a similar manner uh, in both cohorts, the, the patients and the controls. Uh, we didn't see any uh, COVID-19 case uh, in the controls. There was one case in the patient cohort. We ended this, uh, that was in August. Uh, it was six months after the second dose. It was in, uh, during the Delta uh, variant, not the Omicron. Uh, and uh, uh, all the adverse effects that uh, were previously reported were resolved. Uh, several studies uh, conducted in Israel, many studies uh, were published from Israel, uh, depicted uh, similar trends. There was uh, a study from uh, uh, Ichilov uh, indicated uh, that immediately after the um, second uh, vaccine, again, seropositivity was uh, 88%. Uh, the ones that were seronegative were uh, treated with chemotherapy. Uh, another um, uh, study from uh, Rabin Medical Center indicated the same, 90%. And uh, Sheba Medical Center had uh, uh, the same um, uh, design of our study, uh, indicated again seropositivity of 30% after the first dose, and it reached 84% after the second dose. Again, seronegative cases were most treated uh, with chemotherapy. And when we did kind of like a pooled analysis of all the seronegative from all the studies in Israel, uh, since we really tried to find any key factor uh, um, of those patients, we saw that the only factor that was uh, significant was uh, treatment uh, uh, with chemotherapy. What about other immunocompromised patients? Uh, so immune response to mRNA vaccines uh, greatly differs upon the nature of immunosuppressive therapy and the underlying disease. Uh, patients with autoimmune conditions or CLL treated with B-cell depleting antibodies have predictably diminished uh, overall response. Most of the studies uh, um, um, sought to study the, the um, serology level. Patients with anti-TNF therapies are less affected, and organ transplant recipients mount very poor antibody response to uh, the first time RNA immunization relative to the general population, and the second immunization increased those levels. We can see this um, study from, uh, from Shiba uh, uh, that uh, um, compared several uh, immunocompromised uh, populations and uh, found that age above 65 and underlying immunosuppression were significantly associated with a non-reactive response of IgG uh, antibody production. We can see here that HIV, for example, resembled the general population with 98% uh, of um, IgG production. Uh, solid malignancies, as we mentioned, uh, 84%, but uh, kidney transplant and uh, heart transplant uh, were much, much lower. 
And this is a very recent, uh, two weeks ago, systematic review that was published uh, of 31 studies evaluating uh, vaccine outcomes in cancer patients. Uh, they found that the overall um, safety and immunogenicity was quite well. But as we can see here in the diagram, uh, we can divide the patients uh, by uh, the type of malignancies. So hematologic malignancies, as we can see here, they demonstrate a very low response uh, if we talk about um, serology as a marker. Uh, while uh, solid tumors treated with chemotherapy, they have less response compared with the ones that are not treated with chemotherapy, but in general, they are uh, comparable to the general population, uh, especially the ones that are not treated with chemotherapy. This is another study uh, published uh, at the beginning of December uh, in Nature Medicine, uh, following a cohort of 53 cancer patients with solid malignancies treated with uh, IV chemotherapy that were compared to uh, healthy controls, and they uh, were looking for both group, uh, arms uh, of, of uh, uh, the immune system, the cellular and the humoral, and they saw that uh, the neutralizing antibodies were detected at 67% of the patient, that was a very small sample size, uh, after the first immunization, but then there was uh, an increase uh, by threefold uh, in the titers after the second dose, and uh, when they looked at uh, the T cell response, which is very, very relevant, especially today when we see uh, that despite the vaccination, there are um, um, individuals that are being infected. Uh, similar patterns were observed for T cell, but the magnitude of each of these response was reduced uh, relative to the uh, control uh, cohort. We see this lag also in, uh, in the T cell response, not only in the um, antibody production. And they saw uh, for the booster, uh, they saw um, for 20 patients, they had, uh, they had them enrolled into a phase one trial. They saw that uh, the um, outcomes of, um, in terms of safety of the booster was quite manageable. And they saw that uh, the booster uh, induced a, a threefold increase in uh, antibody response uh, uh, one week after the, the booster, but no increase was observed in the T cell response. There is another study that was published on cancer patients uh, uh, from uh, Ichilov uh, um, uh, regarding the booster. Uh, they saw that uh, before the booster in that uh, cohort of patients, 28% were uh, uh, negative, seronegative, compared with 1% of, uh, of the general uh, cohort that they had. Uh, and after the administration of the booster, uh, most of the uh, patients and all of the uh, healthy cohort uh, remain um, uh, seropositive. There was a significant increase in the uh, IgG absolute antibody concentration in both groups that were, uh, was noted here. I can say that two years after the uh, beginning of the pandemic, uh, we um, as clinicians, at least in Israel, but also worldwide, we don't see any catastrophe regarding uh, cancer patients with solid malignancies. Uh, so apparently uh, they may be infected, but there is uh, something that uh, does not uh, um, um, consider them as, as a high risk population. But uh, yet, uh, of course, uh, um, people may say that they uh, um, protect themselves more than the general population as well. So still it is uh, an unsolved uh, uh, issue. Uh, there are some unsolved questions that are still there. What is the correlation between serology and competent immunity uh, to COVID-19? We don't know. Most of the study rely on the um, uh, serology, and today we know that there are many people that are uh, seropositive, and yet they may uh, be infected. What is the profile and function of memory B cells in cancer? Uh, patients. Uh, there are some modifications uh, of uh, uh, the immune cells uh, in cancer patients due to the treatment. Some of them, um, um, especially immunotherapy, uh, modified uh, exactly uh, those components. We don't know. Uh, does immunotherapy confers superior or long-lasting immunity following vaccination? This is something that we are following now. And what are the long COVID phenomena uh, in cancer patients who are on active anti cancer treatment? This is something that uh, we don't know. I want to thank uh, um, my wonderful group at, uh, at Rambam and, uh, and the Technion, uh, and uh, my colleague Yuval Shaked for uh, this uh, wonderful collaboration as always. And uh, there are many uh, questions that uh, I guess only time will tell. Thank you.
So I repeat the question, if there is any type of cancer or type of treatment that we have the highest uh, um, antibody production, I have to say that uh, when we uh, looked at uh, most of the study, we tried to focus on the seronegative and not the seropositive. Uh, we didn't see, at least in our study, any uh, significant uh, difference between the groups. We uh, at first thought that maybe lung cancer or patients with lung metastasis, uh, maybe there is going to be something different over there, but we, di we haven't seen. And also with immunotherapy, uh, it was not significant. Uh, I have to say. With the seronegative, the only uh, factor that was significant was chemotherapy alone, N not immunotherapy or other biological agent. So what is the optimal time uh, to get a vaccine after uh, uh, the chemotherapy? So uh, we don't have exact recommendation. This is a very, very uh, typical question that we are being asked by the patient. Uh, we know that uh, since uh, um, the antibody production requires uh, um, at least uh, um, a potent uh, um, blood count, we, we think that uh, it is wise to give uh, the vaccine um, earlier in the course, so the, uh, it, before it drops, but we don't really know. We try to uh, um, get this information from other studies, and I guess uh, we don't know. And also, we try to go over our uh, patients and to see whether there was a correlation between, and we couldn't find any correlation. I have a question, maybe it's to you and to Dina. Is there, has there been any changes in the recommendations to distinguish how we will, should vaccinate the solid tumors patients versus the hematological malignancies ones? So uh, maybe Dina would like to mention uh, on the hematological, but uh, the guidelines uh, uh, until today is uh, to prioritize hematological patients uh, rather than solid malignancies, uh, patients with solid malignancies. Uh, and even um, in Israel, we had uh, um, many discussions on that. And the, the, uh, at the end, the recommendation was to follow the general population for the solid malignancies and to prioritize the uh, patients with the hematological malignancies. As for the hematological malignancies, we don't give uh, vaccination to patients uh, under treatment with anti-CD20, uh, rituximab, or, rituximab or gaziva. A very interesting observation, and I found later that somebody published it as a short communication, that patients with CLL were the worst patient. They are very, very sick. Treated with the ibrutinib, which is bruton kinase inhibitor, uh, had a better course uh, concern because of a lack of cytokine storm. It like uh, abrogate the cytokine storm. And we have now a good experience with uh, Paxlovid. Uh, patients with CLL receiving Paxlovid very early in the disease when they are just uh, uh, diagnosed, they have a better course. So we are optimistic. But we have to stop the, uh, the brutinib when we treat them because it's a, uh, there is an interaction between the drugs. And thank you for a very nice study.